This is the Commission Church Online. Welcome to our podcast. We want to be a church who brings heaven on earth through the word of God and the love of Christ. I pray this week's message blesses you. We're starting our our new series on the book of Matthew. Uh, I'm kind of excited because it's a series that I've been praying about, I've been preparing in my heart, and I've been gearing towards for the last few months. Uh, As you guys know, we do a lot of standalone messages uh, during the year, and in between last, uh, our last sermon series and this one, we did a bunch of standalone messages, and they were great. Uh, They were messages that God spoke to us in a very particular season in our church's life. But as we always do as a church, we are not only a spirit-filled church, but we're also a Bible-based church. And uh, what that really means is that we take time to study the Word of God. Uh, We don't apologize for going into the Bible, verse by verse, if we should, chapter by chapter, uh, book by book. And we've done many books of the Bible just like that. And today, we want to start studying the book of Matthew in a broader perspective. And... um, Unlike the other studies we've done, we probably might not go verse to verse, but we'll, we'll try to encapsulate the essence of what the gospel writer, Matthew here, is trying to communicate uh, with the reader. Um, <clears throat> this book was written in around AD 60, and it was, it's, it's actually in a chronological order. If it was written, it would be second on that list. Luke will be first, and then it would be Matthew. But because of the the theological richness and uh, just because Matthew was well-versed in Greek and Hebrew, uh, the Jewish readers of that day took to Matthew's writing and it uh, it applied a lot more and uh, there was this, there's a lot of depth through his, to his writing that can be relayed in a very comprehensible and a powerful way. Not just that, the focus of Matthew's writing was to focus on Jesus Christ who is the savior of the world. He wanted to let the whole world know that this savior, this Jesus that the world has been anticipating, has been looking forward to, this savior is here. And this savior changes the world. Man, you you get to wonder about this man called Matthew. This This man called Matthew, he was a tax collector. The profession hadn't been too popular in any era but especially it was the case in the time of Jesus Christ. The tax collectors took from their own people and they gave to Rome, and as long as they met their quota, they, you know, the, the, of the tax that they had to bring in by the Roman government, right, they, they, could, they could have collected how much ever they wanted. It wasn't a problem. They could have cheated people, they could have collected more than they should have, and some collectors did the business underground as they hired runners to do their dirty work. But not only was Matthew a tax collector, but he was not an underground one, he was a public tax collector. This is what makes this story a lot more interesting. He didn't have other people doing his dirty work, he did the dirty work himself, right? Uh, he, was, uh, he, he was the leech at the bottom of the pit. He would probably ride his low rider stretch limo decked out with those gangster wall tires and superfly headlights right into the greasiest part of town He would set up a table, hold out his hand, and say, give to me what belongs to me. This is where Jesus met him. In a very similar situation like that, Jesus saw him, and he said, I want you to follow me. He said, come, follow me. You've got to wonder, what did Jesus see in Matthew? And at the same time, you've got to wonder, what did Matthew see in Jesus? I told you about Matthew, but according to Matthew, He was an elitist in society, and when he saw Jesus walking up to him and saying, come and follow me, I mean, look at him. The first impression, dirt under his nails, calloused hands, holes in his sandals, he has no headquarters, he has no business card, he has no business recruiting anybody, he has no office, he has no committee, he has no clout from the local church, He has absolutely no credibility whatsoever. The clergy of that day wouldn't give him their time. His followers looked more like dock hands and shabby hustlers than learned seminarians or theologians. And this guy claimed to be the Messiah? 
This guy was walking up to this distinguished man called Matthew that other people may have hated, but he himself placed himself in an elite class. Yes, he did. And Matthew accepted Jesus' invitation and he never turned back. He spends his, the, the, and the rest of his entire life convincing people that this carpenter was actually the king that was prophesied, the savior of the world, the Messiah that God had promised the people of God. Jesus gave a call and he never took it back. The relationship Jesus had with Matthew can serve to convince us that if Jesus had a place for Matthew, and I want to remind somebody here today, Jesus has a place for you and for me. I give you an introduction, but as we go into the book of Matthew, the first 17 verses are verses that have a lot of names in it. They are, they are a lineage. It's uh, so-and-so had so-and-so, and so-and-so -and -so was so-and-so's baby daddy, and so-and-so -and -so begat so-and-so, and this was their grandfather and grandma, and there was, there's a list of people listed in those first 17 verses that we're not going to get into. It's, it's a passage of scripture that you could probably go and understand. But Matthew does his due diligence in connecting Abraham to Jesus. In the way of bringing David somewhere in between and connecting Jesus and saying he was the son of David. Now I'm going to pick off from verse number, pick up from verse number 18. So read with me. And if you, if you don't have your Bibles with you, follow on the screen. But I urge you as we go in this study, it's going to be an amazing one. I want you to follow along in your word. Bring your Bibles, bring a notepad, take notes because this is going to be a good study. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save the people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. And here comes the prophecy in verse 23. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father God, would you speak to us through this word? I pray, God, that your power and your might will come through in a powerful way this morning. As I share this word, God, I pray that you will give me the ability to share this word the same way you spoke it to me. And I pray, God, that you will give me the ability to break this down into manageable proportions, into bite-sized pieces, pieces that people will be able to digest, that people will be able to chew on, that people will be able to use during this week. And I pray that this, this passage of scripture will speak to us in such a deep and intimate way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, amen. I wanna title my message this morning, He Gets Us. He Gets Us. I want to remind somebody, no matter what situation you're going through in your life, no matter what circumstance, no matter what season, no matter what up, no matter what mountain or valley you're going through, no matter what tearful situation, season, or celebratory season you're going through, I want to remind you that Jesus gets you. Jesus understands what you're going through. And for a lot of Christians, that might sound like a cliche. And for a lot of Christians that speak over other people that are going through seasons like that, it may also sound like a cliche. For somebody that's going through a dark time, it could be a physical ailment, it could be a financial situation, it could be a relationship situation, it's so hard and difficult to understand that Jesus can be present in your hard times. It's easy to see Jesus in your happy times, isn't it? It's easy to see Jesus in your joyful times. But how many of y'all can agree with me and say, Pastor Oshish, it's really difficult to see Jesus in hard times. See, Matthew is writing to a largely Jewish population. And Matthew begins his gospel by demonstrating how Jesus descended from both Abraham and King David. He, he's discussing the circumstances around his birth and this stormy infancy that Jesus has. 
And, and, and then he's, he's asking that question indirectly to us as to why did the glorious God, the creator of the heaven and earth, take, take on such an ordinary human disguise? Matthew indirectly answers three ways in which the incarnation of Jesus, or in other words, I know we hear these words during Christmas, Jesus incarnate, or Jesus came as a baby in human form, and all of that. This passage is very familiar when we studied in the Christmas context. But it's important to understand the importance of Jesus coming down as a human being. God saying, I need to become human. God saying, I need to put skin on. Matthew, very beautifully, along with the other three, go uh, three gospel writers, answers three ways in which how the incarnation of Jesus was necessary for us, for you and for me, to have a true and belonging relationship with Jesus. And I want to remind somebody today, unless and until we check all these three boxes off, and unless and until we comprehend fully what these three points are and how they relate to our relationship with Jesus, we will never fully comprehend and grasp the love of Jesus or the love of God that he has for us, his people. Why did the mystery of incarnation, the coming of God in flesh, what, like, like why is that a mystery and what does that mean for us today? Point number one that I wanna leave with you this morning is God's strength is apparent and weakness. The number one thing that, that Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, all of them will echo and sing very loud, is the fact that through the birth of Jesus Christ as a baby, as a human, as man in flesh, what, what, what the gospel writers want, us, want to communicate to us, the intention of God was to look at you and me and, and communicate that strong overarching message that God's strength is always revealed in apparent weaknesses. See, by becoming human, God became vulnerable. See, people could hurt Jesus psychologically and physically. In fact, they did. Jesus is, 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 we know Jesus to look over the city of Jerusalem and the Bible says he cries. He has sorrow. He has pain. The Bible tells us that he was rejected by his own family members. I mean, think about the scorn that he got from his brothers. Think about it. Like to, today, if, you were to, if, if God was to look at you and say, man, you have a special anointing on you and you get up and you call all your brothers together and say, by the way, I am the son of God. From today, you will call me the son of the living God. Like, think about how much of hate his brothers probably had. Like, think about the number of times his mother would have looked at his other brothers and said, come on now, shape up, be like Jesus. All right, why can't you be like Jesus? Like, he was the example. He was the epitome of grace and, and goodness and love and mercy. But yet, the Bible says he was rejected by his own family. Other friends, other relatives rejected him and they wanted to kill him by throwing him over the cliff at the edge of his own hometown in Luke chapter 4 and verse 29. He saw dejection. He saw rejection. There was growing hatred towards him during his ministry. People tried to stone him. Eventually, you and I know the story, they beat him nearly to death, crucify him. And in the, garden of, in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible says that he bled real blood from his very real wounds. See, if, I, if, if, you, if you told me, Ashish, you need to write a chapter in the Bible, man, I would try to somehow take that passage of Scripture out. I would probably have left that passage out. Why? Because, because we have, what we have here is this image of this powerful Messiah that we're trying to build. This God that is all powerful. This God that is almighty. Like why would I want to portray this almighty God as a God that is bleeding and a God that is, that is, that is bleeding through his pores? Why would I want to show the figure of fear or frailty? Because for centuries, we've recognized that Jesus was all God and all man, but here it seems that he's much more man than he's God because there's so many of these things that you and I can identify with. After all, Jesus' man is so crippled with fear and sorrow that he actually tells Peter, James, and John, his, his, his closest of allies. Like he had 12 dudes, but, but these three were his, his best friends. These three were his, his dudes, like his 
his, his best, best best BFFs, right? He looks at them and he says, he's in a moment of vulnerability, in a moment of pain, in a moment of just opening up his heart. He says, man, in Matthew 26, 38, he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Like that's how much sorrow he was going through. That's how much pain he was going through. I don't know how many of y'all feel that way. There are times that I feel that way. Well, I want to give up. Sonny and I were talking to a young lady yesterday who said, man, there are times that I just want to give up. I don't want to live anymore. I don't want to, I, I, I just don't want to continue because of everything that I'm going through in my life. That's real talk. These are real things that people deal with and some of us, you know, we don't deal with those things but there are people every single day that have thoughts of death. There are suicidal thoughts. People that are probably sitting over here have suicidal thoughts. You, you have thoughts of hurting yourself and Jesus says, man, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow and that sorrow is even taking me to the point of death. This is even dying before being, dying on the cross or being beaten and whipped. All of that stuff was after the fact the very stress that he was going through. How many of you go through stress in your life? To the point where like, oh, Lord, I, just, I, don't, I don't know if I can go on. Hello, am I talking to somebody? And God is reminding somebody, my son went through it. You're like, why me, Lord? Like among everybody in this world, why? No, 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 it's just not you. It started with Jesus. He gets it. Jesus literally begs for his father to change his mind about the suffering that's about to lie ahead. He looks at Jesus and he's pleading with him. And like, like my dad spoke about last week, he's saying, God, would you, father, would you take this cup of suffering away from me? He's in such agony that Luke, the gospel writer, says that Jesus experiences this rare medical condition where he bleeds through the pores in his skin. That's what's going on over here. This medical condition occur, occurs when fear is piled upon fear to where a person can no longer sustain the pain. None of these, uh, of these, of these issues, you know, like, like, like in, this, in this situation, Jesus is not like the John Wayne or, the, or, the, or, or this bold man that's standing over there in the face of adversity and saying, bring it on, I got this. No. You don't see Jesus as a person like that. You see him as somebody that is ridden with fear. And it begs to, to, to ask the question, why include it in the Bible? That's so embarrassing for the Christian world. When my non-Christian friend asked me about that very frail moment, what am I to answer? Why show the Messiah begging for the master plan to be reversed? Why show the King of Kings so racked with fear and doubt and it nearly kills him? Why not move from the Last Supper directly to the betrayal? Because that sounds better on paper. Why do we have to include this story? I'll tell you why. Because God in all his mercy, in all his love, in all his plans, God looks to you and to me and says, it's bigger than that. The story is bigger than what you just see on the outside, what you think inside your heart. The gospel writer chooses instead to include this account of Jesus in the garden, for without it, we would have entirely an incomplete picture of God. I'm reminding somebody today, like your idea of God is incomplete if you don't understand that God sent his son to this world and every pain and every suffering and every tear and every situation and every condition, physical, mental, psychological, it does not matter what your relationship, I can go on and on and on. Jesus went through it all. He gets it. It didn't make him any less powerful, right? Paul writes this, he says, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Which means that every single time we come to the end of the road, God's strength is revealed. Paul is talking about Christ crucified. He's talking about the shameful death, which is surely going to make Jesus look weak, right? And, 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 and this weakness is made stronger, or is and yet this weakness is stronger than man's strength because through it, God conquered sin and God conquered death. Paul is actually talking about his own life. He talks about the thorn in his flesh. How many of y'all have thorns in your flesh that you just can't get away from? 
And after he prays, he hears the Lord Jesus speak to him directly, and he says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Unless and until that moment of weakness was there, the glory of God would never have been revealed in the life of Jesus. Like you and I would never see the glory of God being revealed in our lives unless and until we understand that we are human, that this this mortal body of ours will stop moving one day, that our heart will stop beating one day. Like we have to totally surrender to the will of God and say, God, Lord, but for you, but for your mercy, but for your love, but I will rejoice in my weakness because I know that in my weakness, your strength is, exempl- is exemplified. See, what he summarizes in verse 9, where he says, my grace is sufficient for you, my power is made perfect in your weakness, it spells out in, in four other words in verse number 10, where he says, that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses. He says, all these weaknesses that I'm talking about, I boast, I delight. Why? In insults, he breaks it down into four parts. He says, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in calamities, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Jesus, do you go through these things? Insults? Oh, yes, I did. Hardships? Oh, yes, I did. Persecution? Come on, somebody. Calamity? Oh, don't start now. Jesus checking all these boxes and says, I, I, I done it. I went through it. This was my story, and Paul is confidently starting and saying, man, when people insult me for my faith, when people put me down, when people don't think that I can make it, when my own people that's supposed to trust me, people that are supposed to believe in me, when I am insulted, when I'm physically abused, when when, when I'm verbally abused, man, God is looking at you and saying, man, I went through that as well. Physical abuse? Do you think what Jesus endured was not physical abuse? I need you to go back and read the Bible. We're not okay with beating our children. <laughs> that's abuse. Right? We know that that's, like, like we're not okay with, with, with punishing our children. We're not okay with, with putting them in timeout. A lot of people are like, so hurt. But she's like, man, I, I went through abuse. I know what physical abuse is. They abused me. Hardships. What is hardship? Circumstances that are forced upon you. Reversal of fortune against your will. This could you know, refer, refer to any situation where, you're, where you feel trapped, right? You didn't, you didn't plan it or you didn't think that it would be that way, but there you are, and it's hard. How many of you find yourselves in hard situations and Jesus found himself between a rock and a hard place way too many times? Don't think that you're the only one going, oh, boo-boo to me, like, Lord, why me, Lord, why am I? No, 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 Jesus went through it too. He went through it too. Persecutions, wounds or abuses of, of painful circumstances or acts of prejudice or exploitation from people because of your faith or because of your Christian moral commitments. It's when you're not treated fairly. Man, you, you get a rod. God's like, Jesus like, I've been there, done that. Calamities, I've done that. Like Jesus Christ lived out that truth in his own life and he calls us to do the same. What would it look like when you and I can look at our weaknesses and say, you know what? This moment, I'm going to enjoy this moment because I'm going to allow God's light and the love of Jesus and the grace of Jesus and the power of God to shine through my life and for the whole world to see. I'm not going to quench this light anymore. I'm going to allow Jesus to shine through this moment. That's what I'm talking about. Point number one, he's, he, Matthew's trying to communicate to us is exactly that. He says, God's strength is apparent in man's weakness. Point number two, by becoming human, Jesus understands the human condition. He understands our human condition. He gets us, y'all. How would we know God cared if he had not become man, just like you and me? How would we know that he understood what it is like to live in a human body? Like, how would we know that he understood how difficult life can be and to feel the pressure of emotion and passion? Jesus knew temptation. We're going to talk about that a little more in Matthew chapter, uh, uh, I I think it's four. When we get there, we'll, we'll talk a little more about it, but I'm not going to get too much into it. But he was in the desert for 40 days being sent, but being tempted by Satan But because he was built and wired just like us, we understand that he understands the human condition. 
You know what the Bible says? The Bible says this in Hebrews 4, 14, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. He's not just sitting up there in his holy high horse saying, oh, I'm sorry that that's happening to you. No, no, no. The Bible is very clear in saying he sympathizes. He knows exactly what you and I are going through. And it says, but we have, we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. He gets us. See, Jesus is that part of God that we can never forget what it is like to be human. Be sure that these were real temptations that pulled at Jesus and, 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 and the real temptations that just pull at you as well. And remember, you're not alone in this journey. He understands. The Bible says he sympathizes. He says, man, I get it. That's what he says. I understand what you're going through. My wife was about to deliver our third baby and a second and a first. I just held her hand and I said, babe, I'm praying for you. I'm rooting for you. I, like, like the first one, I made, a, I made a real bad mistake the first time. The first baby, I didn't know what I was doing. So I, I said, babe, I, I feel you. I feel what you're going through right now. She said, no, you don't. She said, no, you don't. She squeezed my hand a lot more harder. Man, I needed to go to therapy after that. It was, it was really bad. I corrected myself after that. I said, no, I don't feel what you're going through. I don't want to feel what you're going through. But I... I'm, I'm here for you. But Jesus says, I feel you. I, I don't know what situation you're in. It, it could be any situation that you're going through. He says, man, the temptations that you're going through, you're like, God, it keeps coming back over and over and over again. And Jesus says, yep, I know what that feels like. We'll talk more about that. But the Bible says, man, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Don't just sit there and be okay with temptation. Temptation may come, but Jesus is lending his hand out. He's reaching out to you and saying, I'm here. I'm offering my help. I'm saying, come to me. I'm saying, I'll help you through your situation. Read the word. Take the word. Pray. Go into the presence of God and say, God, I need you more and more. Jesus knew poverty. Jesus said, man, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He's like, man, you think I'm, I, I, I'm a high roller? I have motels to stay in, and people just lay out, you know, one time you saw people just putting out, you know, cloths for me on the road, and you think every day is rosy? Like, no, 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 no. Sometimes I don't even know where I'm going to lay my head. <laughs> Jesus knew frustration. He scattered the coins of money changers and overturned their tables. Get out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market, he said. Oh, you have an anger problem? Don't kill yourself over it. Look at Jesus and say, Jesus, I need help through this. And, and the Bible says he's reaching out and saying, let me help you. Come on, this place got awfully quiet. Some of us need help with our anger. Can I talk to somebody? No, two people said, yeah. I, I, it has to be more than that. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Jesus knew a weariness. Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down from the well. Like some of us need to sit down and say, Jesus, help me. In your weariness, Jesus knew disappointment. He said, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers the sick, but you are not willing. He knows what it is. You're, you're probably like, man, he doesn't have kids. He has no idea what disappointment it is. No, 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 trust me, he has, he has all of y'all. All of us, all of me. He has me, the biggest kid. Biggest disappointment. Sometimes I feel like I've disappointed God so much. Hmm. Jesus knew sorrow. He said, my soul is overwhelmed. The verse that we just read, Jesus knew ridicule. Again and again, they struck him and spat on him, falling on their knees. They paid homage to him. They mocked him is what the Bible says. That's crazy when someone has to just over and over and over and over ridicule you and put you down and verbally abuse you. I don't know how many of y'all have been in relationships like that or been in work situations like that. You know the number of people that I've counseled that you've gone through work situations where it might be a boss, it might be a supervisor that has just berated you over and over and over and your self-morale is like zero? And today I want to speak life over somebody and say, Jesus knows exactly what you've been through and what you're going through. Give it into the hands of Jesus because he says, I want to help you. That's what Hebrew says. Jesus knew loneliness. 
You're lonely? Welcome to the club. Jesus is like, man, he looked at the father and said, why have you, Lord, I, why have you forsaken me? He felt the most loneliest in a moment that he needed to be hugged, the moment that he needed to be embraced. How many of y'all in moments that you want someone to call you, you want someone to embrace you, you want someone to reach out to you, feel the loneliest in your life? Jesus felt that. Jesus knew rejection. In John 6, 66, the Bible says, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. This was early on in his ministry, not towards the end. Towards the end too, but early in his ministry, they started listening to what Jesus was saying. It's like, peace out, Jesus. I, I, this is too much for me to understand. Sorry, you're all by yourself right now. This is way too much for us. He, he, he knew what rejection was. At his greatest point of need, Jesus was let down by his companions. When his followers saw the soldiers come to arrest Jesus, the Bible says all the disciples deserted him and they fled is what the Bible says. They weren't like, peace out, we'll we'll, we'll see you later. They were like, "Ah, you're not even going to say, you're not even going to say a goodbye. They were out of there. Jesus was always misunderstood. Not even his innermost circle knew him. They didn't understand his mission, but here's the deal. Jesus went without the comfort of human fellowship so that he might say to you, never will I leave you. He went through that so that he can reassure you and he can show you, I get it. I know what loneliness is. I know what rejection is. So I want to give you a word that comes from me. And that word is, no, though, the, though the heaven and earth may fail, I will not leave you. That I will, I will always embrace. I will, I will never forsake you. Is what Jesus is looking at his church and saying. Because Jesus understands, man. The man of many sorrows. He was. He's familiar with suffering. And he says, "Never will I forsake you." I don't know what you're going through, church. So whenever I feel sorrowful. These moments, I, I, I even texted a few people the other day and said, hey, pray for me. I'm going through some stuff and I need, I need God to do something in my life. Whenever I feel sorrowful, I look to Jesus who endured a greater grief and sorrow than I do. Yet even on that day, Jesus could say, man, blessed are those who mourn. Like sorrow forces us to identify more deeply with our suffering Savior. And that's a blessing. Blessed are those who mourn. No matter what you're going through, I'm telling you, somebody needs to hear this. You have a God who is intimately acquainted with all your ways. That's what Psalms 139 verse 3 says. He is intimately acquainted with all your ways. Point number three, I'm going to close with this. By becoming human, God's desire is to be with us. God's desire is to be with us. Man, how easy would would it have been for God to remain aloof and distance himself from human pain and suffering? Actually, if God is the God of love as we say he is, it wouldn't have been easy at all. Like, if he truly loves his creation, he could not have stayed away. Like, I'm impressed by the number of times in scripture where I read Jesus wanting to be with people and people to be with him. Even on the cross, he looks at the thief and he says, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. In the garden, he looks at his disciples and his father, I want those who you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. When he chose his disciples, he looked, at, he looked at God and said, Jesus went on the mountainside and called to him who he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12, designating them apostles that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. Here is God becoming a man that he might be with us. Worship team, you guys can get ready to come up. There's this story by Mark Twain uh, and he's, the story is about this Connecticut Yankee in uh, King Arthur's court. So he's, he's writing and he's telling, this, the story tells his adventures of this ordinary man who's this Connecticut Yankee from, from the 19th century who's transported back to the medieval world, right, uh, to, to the world of King Arthur. And the story, there's this one point at which he convinces King Arthur to dress up like a peasant. 
and, and to take a journey through his kingdom. He says, man, I, I just want you to see how your kingdom is. See it firsthand. See it, you know, like, like everybody else sees it. So that's what he did. The results are generally laughable as a king, you know, and, 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 and completely oblivious to, to life in the trenches and completely oblivious to life in the streets and what it was really like. He tries to carry on with all the pomp of the court and while those around him simply think he's crazy, he thinks he could just be him, himself, when everybody else was suffering around him. But there's this touching chapter titled The Smallpox Hut. And it describes how King Arthur and his companion, they happen upon a beggar's house. And at the door of the house, the husband is laid dead. It's called a smallpox hut. Smallpox has come and done a number on them. The husband lays dead at the door and the wife tries to warn them away. She says, for the fear of God who visits, with, who visits here, get away as fast as you can. This place is cursed. You don't want to enter. She sees it's the king, so the king responds, and he says, let me come in and help you, I'm your king. You are sick, and you are in trouble. The woman looks at the king and says, man, you, you really don't want to, this is a diseased home. You should go away, and the king insists. So because he insists, the woman asks the king to go into the loft and check up on their child. It was a desperate place for him to be in. It was a dangerous place. It would have cost him his life, probably. But there was no use arguing with him because his mind was resolved. He wanted to go get the girl. So the story goes on to say how the king disappears up the ladder looking for the girl. And there was a slight noise from the direction of the dim corner where the ladder was, and it was the king descending. And on one arm, he was bearing this little girl this frail little girl, she was 15 years old, and by the other hand, he was assisting himself down the ladder. She was half conscious, she was dying of smallpox. Here was heroism, at its last and loftiest possibility, at its utmost summit of sorts. It was challenging death in an open field, unarmed, with all the odds against the challenger. No reward set in saying, hey, you'll get this if you do this, nothing of that sort. And no admiring world in silks or cloth of gold to gaze and applaud. And yet the king's bearing was as serenely brave as it had always been in those cheaper contests where king where night meets night in equal fight and clothes and protecting steel. He was great now, sublimely great. It was a king in commoner's garb bearing death in his arms. That's what made it special, that he had nothing to gain, he had nothing to lose. It was just a desire of his to go out there and be there for that family. You know, God's desire is to be with us. He laid aside his royal robes and the, the supernatural crown in spite of the terrible cost of bearing death in his arms. He took on that shame. He took on that pain. He took on that scorn. He took on that beating for you and for me. And I know that who I'm talking to in this room, everybody is different and you're going through something different, but there's one thing that we each have in common. At some point in time, and to some degree, on some level, we all will experience suffering if you already have not. As I look across this room, I see a number of people who've experienced some kind of unspeakable tragedy in your life. 
And I'm talking about maybe a, a, a loss of life. It could be the death of a loved one. It could be the loss of a career. It could be the, the, the loss of a marriage. It could be a loss of a relationship. It could be a broken relationship or a promise unfulfilled. But God's promise for you and for me today is that no matter how much it hurts, no matter how much you suffer, you do not suffer alone. Jesus went through it and he says, I sympathize. He says, I offer my hand out in help he says lay hold of this promise the good news of the gospel that Matthew is trying to communicate is that Jesus became flesh he took on your pain he took on my pain he took on his own pain because man he wanted to take that suffering on himself because God he, 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 he just didn't do it because of anything else he wanted to become a part of it God is our Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's what it means. I don't know what suffering you're experiencing today. Maybe it's physical pain. Maybe it's intense anxiety. Maybe it's terminal illness. Maybe it's something that's irreversible. Maybe it's a brokenness that is incomprehensible. But my encouragement to you is as simple as this. Jesus gets it. He gets it. I want you to stand up to your feet this morning. Today we get to enjoy one of the most amazing things that we as a church will do together. And that's to have communion. You know, it's in, it's, it's in the moment of communion that you and I as believers of Jesus Christ, we get to exercise and we get to proclaim what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. What better week to celebrate communion than this week? When we get to hear what Jesus meant. What the coming of Jesus meant as a, like I said when I started this message, like you and I will never see pain or will never understand pain in the light of the goodness of God unless and until we understand the divine plan of God in sending his own son as a human being to suffer before we did. You know what this reminds us of? This reminds us that Jesus is coming back soon. How many of y'all know that? That one day we don't have to take this anymore. Like, we're doing this now, but there's a day coming that Jesus is coming back. That's the day that I'm waiting for. The second coming is near. Man, he's gonna, suffering doesn't have the last word. And when his people enter that new Jerusalem on that glorious day, the Bible says that he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away and the new has come. And I wanna guarantee somebody standing here today that you are not alone in your pain, that you are not alone in your suffering. He gets it. Look at somebody standing next to you and say, he gets it. He gets it. I want you to remind yourself that this week. Every time you're going through hardship, remind yourself that you're not alone in this race. He gets it. And I, I gave you every possible situation known to man. Okay, if I didn't cover a category, come to me and I'll give you a Bible verse for it. I'll tell you of how Jesus addressed that. I'll tell you how Jesus suffered through that same situation that you're going through. Every single thing. And he says, cast your burdens on me because I care. I care. And that's the, that's the resounding message. I care. Here, my helping hand. Like, are you hearing these words, this, these, these resound, I, I, I care, I, I want to help, my, my heart is with you, like, like I'm inviting you, I want you to be with me, I want to be with you, there's this, there's this idea of Jesus wanting to be present in your situation, he just doesn't want you to be there by yourself, he doesn't want you to fight that battle by yourself, he says the battle belongs to me, don't stand there and try to fight this by yourself, give it to the hands of Jesus. That is why he went to the cross, to fight that on your behalf. As we celebrate this today, y'all, this is one of the most potent reminders of 
what the cross means. Communion is one of the greatest reminders and the uh, the greatest expressions of God's love for his people. This bread that we're about to have, it represents the, symbolizes the body of Jesus Christ. And this cup that has juice in it symbolizes the blood that was shed on that cross. He took human form, he became flesh. God with skin on. Because he wanted to remind you and me that he gets it. This is one of the most glorious reminders for you and for me. And the Bible reminds us and says, do it as often as you can. As often. I pray that we will do this as often as we can when you need to be reminded of the pain that you're going through. And I encourage people, when you're with your family, do this. Fathers and mothers, when you're going through pain, do this. When you are coming together in prayer, when you're leading your family in prayer, get some bread, get some juice, get together and explain to your children, in this moment of suffering, let's look to Jesus because let's remind ourselves that we're not going through this alone, but this bread speaks that Jesus' body was broken and bruised and beaten for us and he knows exactly what we're going through. That we're crying and we're going through tears, but Jesus gets it. The day he was betrayed, the Bible says, he took the bread. Can you peel that first layer, take the bread in your hands? He took the bread. And Paul recounts it this way, for I have received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took the bread and when he had given thanks, He broke it. Can you break this bread? And he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Y'all, we get to do this because we get to remind ourselves that he went through it before I did. He gets it. I don't know what pain you're going through. I don't know what dead end you're standing at, but Jesus was at a dead end with his back against a wall, not knowing where to go. His depression and his sadness and his pain, almost he almost thought that he was gonna die because of the pain that he was going through. The stress and his anxiety caused blood to seep through his pores. That's how bad of a medical condition he had, that moment of pain. But yet when he was given that choice of that world's the the sin of the world coming upon his shoulder although as a man he did not want to do it he still looked at his father and said not my will but your will be done I'm looking for some Christians some believers that can say pastor I don't understand the situation I'm going through I don't understand this this problem I'm going through I don't understand this financial situation this dead end that I'm at but I know that God is going to get the glory from this If I'm healed, God's gonna get the glory from this. If I don't get healed, God is gonna get the glory from this. If I'm gonna go to the cross, God is still gonna get the glory for this. But today I wanna remind you that Jesus went on the cross and he gave up his body for you and for me. The Bible reminds us that by his stripes, you and I, we were healed. Father, we wanna thank you, Lord, for what this represents. Although a wafer in our hands, This represents something holy, something beautiful, something mighty, something wholesome, something so powerful. And that's the body that was given to us that told us that we are healed and restored and sanctified. So we thank you and we praise you. We thank you for this sacrifice. As we partake of this, I pray God that we will celebrate. We will celebrate what you did on the cross. We will celebrate your incarnation God in flesh. God becoming man to identify with us. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we partake of this bread together, church? And the same way he took the cup, he gave thanks. And he said this, it represents my blood. 
He goes on in verse 25 and 26. It's in the same way he took the cup after the supper and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes back. I pray that as we partake of this cup, as we partake of the, as we part, we already partake of this bread, I pray that we will remind ourselves that we have a duty, y'all. Before you drink this, I want to remind you something. You and I have a responsibility. We have a duty. In a grand culmination, as I finish this book of Matthew in, in chapter number 28, we're going to go back to why we called our church Commission Church. Because the purpose of Matthew and this, the gospel according to Matthew is to, to take Jesus, who was the Savior of the world, the prophesied one, and showing you and me, and he, his aim was to show you and me that not only was he the prophesied one, but he was also the one who came to commission the church and to send you and to me to fulfill the Great Commission. And I pray that until everybody, there's something that we say here at, at Commission Church, until everyone in Plano knows we will not settle. We want it. We want families. We want people that are broken. We want the unchurched, the de church. We want people that don't know Jesus Christ. We, don't, we want people that are hurt by We want them to experience Jesus Christ in his fullness and in his grace. And the Bible reminds us that and says, we will proclaim this till, the, till he comes back for us. He's going to come back one day. But I pray that till that day, we will, in, we will rejoice in this sacrifice. That blood that was shed on Calvary reminded us that we don't have, we don't need to make another amend. We don't need to approach a, 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 an altar of sacrifice. We don't have to offer blood or animals or any other thing in, 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 and, and in God, in his, in his infinite mercy and his grace, sent his son. And that was the last and final sacrifice that was to be done. And today, you don't walk towards victory. You operate from victory because of this blood that was shed for you and for me. Thank you for listening. We love bringing you the word on so many different platforms. We are so thankful for what God is doing in and through us. We'd love for you to subscribe so you don't miss out. And don't forget to share this message if it has blessed you.